Since the outbreak of hostilities in 1959, United States Army advisors in Vietnam have undergone a variety of experiences and learned much about the complexities of guerrilla warfare in Southeast Asia. Working through MAG, these advisors have increased in number to more than 12,000. Each is assigned to a specific activity or unit of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, commonly referred to as ARVIN, where his chief duties are to make certain that U.S. equipment is used and maintained properly, and to teach by lecture, demonstration, and by setting an example. Perhaps the advisor's most important function is to advise and assist the unit commander, his Arvin counterpart, to make suggestions skillfully and diplomatically in a manner adjusted to the customs and traditions of the Vietnamese and to the individual personality of the commander. Since 1959, in fact since 1956, when MAG advisors were first sent to Vietnam, many lessons have been learned, many guidelines, techniques and principles have been developed. Perhaps the best way to describe the experiences of U.S. advisors in their relationship with the Vietnamese and to illustrate the lessons learned is to tell the story of one U.S. officer, Captain William R. Johnston, who from May 1962 until April 1963 served as MAG advisor to the 1st Infantry Battalion, 11th Regiment, 7th Infantry Division, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. 34-year-old Michigan-born Captain Johnston, with a wife and two children in Chicago, would soon learn that his military assignment required a thorough knowledge of counter-guerrilla techniques and infantry tactics, as well as of all staff functions. More important, he would discover that to maintain a workable relationship with Captain Tran Tien Khan, his Arvin counterpart, and with other Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, he would have to make some changes in his approach toward human relationships. His counterpart, Captain Khan, had received infantry and artillery training in the United States, but there was still the large gulf of two divergent cultures separating them. To function efficiently as a unit advisor, it would be up to Captain Johnston to bridge this gulf as rapidly and as completely as Vietnamese customs would permit. As Johnston met officials, such as the district chief and Arvin regimental commander, he was aware of the need to understand the Vietnamese people without becoming involved in their politics. The advisor's duty was to adhere to the U.S. national policy, and his obligation would be to support the military operations of the incumbent government of Vietnam. When Johnston reported to the 1st Battalion, they were stationed at a sugar mill at Hipwa. The main source of sugar, rum, and molasses for all of the Republic of Vietnam it was located in the Mekong Delta on the Oriental River, 16 kilometers east of the Cambodian border. One primary mission of the 1st Battalion was to provide security for the mill, as well as to stop the Viet Cong from forcibly collecting taxes from farmers who brought in sugar cane. Captain Johnston made it a point not to rush matters in establishing himself with the Vietnamese and with Captain Cong. With them here is Sergeant Doc, a school teacher drafted into the Army, and now Johnston's interpreter. The American captain learned that the mill employed 2,000 workers and was in an area largely controlled by the Viet Cong. He and Con estimated that 30% of the employees were guerrillas who operated on night patrols disrupting supply lines. Feeling his way carefully, one of Captain Johnston's first recommendations was to improve artillery emplacements, thereby increasing flexibility of fire for the 155 howitzers at the sugar mill. He also suggested that living in shelters improvised from ponchos was neither helping morale nor contributing to supply economy, and Khan agreed to construct barracks. Another basic mission of the battalion was to secure a portion of the only usable road for transport of personnel, sugar, and supplies 
between the mill and Saigon. The road led through Viet Cong infested territory with an estimated two companies of guerrillas operating in the 1st Battalion's area of responsibility. However, despite the presence of the 1st Battalion, word was received one morning that the road had been cut during the night. Captain Johnston hurried to the scene, where it was reported that the Viet Cong were still in the area. Battalion troops arrived a few minutes later. The battalion commander was at regimental headquarters, and by now Johnston had learned that Khan's workload was such that he could not always be available. The second company tried to intercept the guerrillas, but only succeeded in driving them into the jungle. By this time, Johnston considered himself a member of the battalion, was aware that the officers and men liked to hear him say, we'll do this, or our battalion. He recommended a course of action to the company commander, remembering that an advisor never commands, only suggests. With the Viet Cong still within range, a 30 caliber machine gun was brought into use. A 60 millimeter mortar crew quickly set up their weapon and began firing. Suspects were rounded up for interrogation. Johnston would assist in this as soon as he could. Once the guerrillas were driven off and the chance of harassing fire reduced to a minimum, civilians recruited by the district chief began repairing the road. Some of these same farmers had undoubtedly been recruited by the Viet Cong to dig it up the night before. There were several motives for cutting the road. Most important, of course, was to disrupt transportation and supply. These passengers disembarking so their bus can bypass the damaged portion illustrate another motive, which was to enable the Viet Cong to halt civilian traffic in order to recruit guerrillas, capture or kill officials, take hostages, collect money, and to deliver propaganda harangues and leaflets. When the road was sufficiently repaired, the flow of traffic resumed, taking passengers to their destinations, as well as fuel and supplies to the sugar mill. As a result of the cutting of the road and other night activity by the Viet Cong, Captain Johnston made a recommendation which led to the first appreciable disagreement between him and Captain Khan. The recommendation was for regular night patrols throughout the area. Although it was eventually followed, the battalion commander refused at first because he was adhering to the old concept of fighting by day and defending by night. Johnston then asked permission to lead volunteer patrols and Khan reluctantly consented. They proved so successful that the battalion commander drew up his own plans for nightly patrols, receiving high praise from division. Johnston's reward was satisfaction from the results obtained. While stationed at the sugar mill, Captain Khan, Captain Johnston, and the 1st Battalion participated in other combat operations either at company level, as a battalion, or as part of a larger unit. Helicopters played an important role in such operations, and it was up to Johnston to request helicopter support through the regimental advisor, as well as to brief U.S. pilots. The 1st Battalion operated with an airborne unit during this mission, which was designed to clear an area of the Dukwa district where Viet Cong had been active near the capital region. At first, to get an idea of the capabilities of battalion troops, Johnston accompanied the lead elements. Huts, which served as guerrilla hideouts, and CPs were burned to the ground. A communist information booth was also leveled by 1st Battalion soldiers and members of the Self-Defense Corps. Even in the midst of combat, troops took a break. Johnston quickly learned that Vietnamese have less stamina than Americans and that they must have frequent breaks and four meals a day.
However, this did not interfere with a highly successful mission. A sizable number of prisoners and suspects were captured. When Johnston arrived on the scene, he learned that they had not been searched. He suggested to the company commander that this be remedied. One was found to be on the wanted list, a hardcore Viet Cong named Liu, who had committed murders and atrocities against civilians. Interrogation of prisoners presented a major and continuing problem to Johnston in his capacity as an advisor. It was also an infantry advisor's responsibility to help arrange for armor support when needed. In a later mission, these M113 armored personnel carriers were requested to assist the 1st Battalion in clearing an area of the Mekong Delta. The high grass made it easy for the Viet Cong to hide. However, some were captured and many suspects flushed out for interrogation. In obtaining armor or any other support, it was up to the U.S. advisor to make his counterpart aware of its availability as well as to establish liaison with each supporting unit through the MAG Advisory Team Headquarters in Mito. In addition to armor and army aviation, other support obtained by Captain Johnston and Captain Khan included artillery, engineer, signal, ordnance, medical, and naval. It was while the battalion was stationed at the Hipwa Sugar Mill that Johnston recommended inauguration of a program designed to retrain the unit's personnel. The U.S. advisor devoted much time to helping supervise this training, which emphasized techniques especially adapted to the local terrain, as well as weapons training. This exercise stressed unit tactics in clearing an area. Both the training and the area selected proved so successful that higher headquarters assigned the 1st Battalion the task of training three companies of recruits as regimental replacements. These recruits, as well as members of the battalion who could be spared, were also given training on the new Claymore anti-personnel mine. Because the demonstration range which the battalion built was located outside the compound and trainees were subject to sniper fire, they kept loaded weapons in hand. The lecture phase was conducted by Lieutenant Keem, Battalion S-5. Johnston had recommended him for this duty because he spoke some English and the two could communicate directly. The U.S. advisor had then given Keem additional English instruction, as well as an intensive course in the use of the mine. Throughout his tour as advisor, Johnston had become increasingly aware of the necessity of double-checking the translation of his words, especially since he had discovered that instructors and interpreters often injected their own feelings or opinions on a subject instead of translating literally. During the first few classes on the Claymore, Johnston personally set the mine in the ground and prepared it for detonation. Realizing the importance of teaching by demonstration, he showed no reluctance about getting his hands dirty. However, he realized it would be wrong to continue to do the work himself and that he would have to persuade one of the battalion officers to take on the responsibility. Use of bayonets to hammer in targets illustrated a minor but persistent problem he faced as an advisor. Ever since he joined the battalion, he had observed the men misusing the bayonet instead of employing more appropriate tools. Frequent on-the-spot corrections and appeals to the battalion commander had thus far produced no result. With targets in place and the lecture phase completed, Johnston let Lieutenant Vinn, a company commander, detonate the mine.
something was wrong. It failed to detonate. Johnston quickly improvised a field expedient method, removing the batteries and teaming up with Lieutenant Vinn to make manual contact. Early in January 1963, two companies of the 1st Battalion moved from the Hipwa sugar mill to the village of Duqua, where Major Bach, the regimental commander, was on hand to greet Johnston and Captain Kahn. A CP was set up in the village pagoda. The tiger on the sign is a religious symbol. The other two companies remained at or near the sugar mill to help the Self-Defense Corps Company take over the 1st Battalion's security mission. It was at this time that 1st Lieutenant Joe M. Clement of Atlanta, Georgia, joined the battalion as training advisor and assistant to Captain Johnston. Sergeant Doc helped orient Lieutenant Clement on the surrounding terrain. Shortly afterwards, Master Sergeant Jones of Baltimore, Maryland, arrived to serve as the battalion's first enlisted advisor. Primary reason for moving two companies of the battalion to Duqua was to have them help convert the village into a strategic hamlet. Since Duqua was in the heart of Viet Cong country, Johnston never went anywhere without his AR-15 rifle, keeping it by his side even when he slept. His chief duty at this time was to advise Captain Khan on providing security for workers constructing the hamlet, as well as on planning patrols and company size operations. This battalion soldier was captured and killed by the Viet Cong while guarding the construction site at night. There was another basic reason for the battalion's move to Duqua. This was so it could provide security for a road reconstruction project. Rendered impassable by the Viet Cong in 1959, repair of this road would provide a shorter route from Duqua to Saigon. Captain Johnston went over it carefully so he could advise the battalion commander on plans for protection of construction crews. Actual reconstruction was done by civilians who were paid for their labor by the Vietnamese government. Arvin engineers lent support with bulldozers, other equipment, and personnel. During the entire project, Johnston maintained liaison with U.S. engineer advisors. Despite security measures, the Viet Cong dug up repaired sections at night and subjected workers to harassing fire. On this occasion, Sergeant Jones spotted a guerrilla force while Johnston, after several refusals, persuaded the company commander to call for mortars. He also found time to reassure an anxious mother, whose son was being interrogated as a suspect, that he would not be mistreated. In addition to their basic duties, the three U.S. advisors concerned themselves with battalion morale. These palm fronds were for the roof of a barracks Johnston had recommended, Captain Kahn had authorized, and Lieutenant Clement had been delegated to supervise. Even though Johnston expected to be reassigned to the United States before it was completed, he had not hesitated to recommend its construction. He knew he could count on Lieutenant Clement, his probable successor as battalion advisor, to follow through on the project. At Johnston's suggestion, Clement and Sergeant Jones, with Sergeant Doc aiding, assisted USIS activity by presenting residents of Duqua with books, pamphlets, and calendars. Because Duqua was located near the Oriental River and even closer to many access canals, the 1st Battalion was given its most important mission to date. Produce from this rich agricultural area and from the even more productive south was transported by boat to roads which led to Saigon and other cities 
north of the Delta. However, river and road traffic was frequently intercepted by the Viet Cong, who collected tribute from the farmers transporting their produce and terrorized them if they were uncooperative. The 1st Battalion was assigned the mission of clearing the area southeast of Duqua and of constructing a self-defense corps post at the junction of the Kinsong and Kinyang canals near the village of Lee Von Mime. Upon receipt of the order, Captain Johnston and his counterpart formulated a plan for the post, selecting a position which would command both canals and afford the best route for reinforcements. Khan's planning impressed Johnston, convincing him that advising can work both ways, for he was getting many good ideas from his counterpart. The plan included preparation of materials at Duqua and movement of the 1st and 2nd companies from the sugar mill area so that almost the entire battalion would proceed downriver to the construction site. Two platoons would be left at Duqua to secure the CP, and Lieutenant Clement would remain with them. As the men split bamboo to transport downriver, Johnston saw that he'd won a minor but significant victory. They were using machetes instead of bayonets. His appeals to Khan and the men had taken effect, and misuse of bayonets had apparently ended. As they prepared to move downriver, men of the battalion were deeply concerned about something, and it wasn't the prospect of backbreaking work in 120 degree heat or the almost certain casualties they would take. Tet, their version of Chinese New Year, was two weeks away. Unless they completed the SDC post before then, 30% would miss leave time at home and the rest a round of feasts and festivity at Duqua. At a nearby port on the Oriental River, the equipment was loaded on board LCMs. Responding to requests through command and advisory channels, the Navy of the Republic of Vietnam had assigned four landing craft in support of the battalion's mission. Johnston was on hand to watch the LCMs pull out. Manned by Vietnamese Navy personnel, the craft would transport the equipment by river and then canal to the construction site. Meanwhile, the battalion paralleled the river on foot, its immediate objective to clear the intervening area of Viet Cong. Walking with them were Johnston and the battalion commander. They cleared villages and searched huts all along the populated route to the site of the SDC post. Johnston and his counterpart found that all adult males had left confirming their belief that most of the population were Viet Cong. At another hut, a last moment escape by VC was indicated by food still being cooked. Despite all precautions, an ambush resulted in the wounding of two men. On the river, the Navy was having its own taste of the Viet Cong, receiving harassing fire from the thick jungle. In return, they opened up with their 20 millimeter cannon. As soon as the battalion arrived at the site of the SDC post, they started digging in to set up a defensive perimeter on Johnston's recommendation. He explained some of his other recommendations to the regimental commander and Khan realizing that it wasn't enough to say this was the way the American army did things. Following a conference, they burned the brush to uncover many traps laid by the communist Viet Cong. With security established, the first LCM was signaled to come in. Johnston lent a hand in tying it to the bank. The battalion was now ready to begin its basic mission, construction of the SDC post, following the plan drawn up by Johnston and his counterpart. The wall for the triangular post would be of mud, which would become almost as hard as concrete when it dried. Up 
A blockhouse was constructed at each corner of the triangle. Captain Kahn personally supervised many phases, while Johnston was everywhere, observing and advising. One of his recommendations was for use of concertina wire. Their joint plan also included the digging of a moat surrounding this entire post. Construction was frequently interrupted by mortar duels with the V.C., who subjected them to harassing mortar and small arms fire. Casualties were sustained by both sides. This SDC soldier received mortar fragments, and an Arvin mortar killed this guerrilla. Viet Cong harassing fire during the post's construction led to a disagreement between advisor and counterpart when Johnston recommended clearing fields of fire in opposition to Khan's desire to spare the local farmers coconut and banana trees. Johnston won his point and SDC personnel, together with members of the battalion, burned fields of fire on both sides of the canal. The following day, another battalion soldier was critically wounded by sniper fire at 11.50 hours, a significant time since it was 10 minutes before virtually all Arvin troops took a two-hour siesta. Arvin helicopter units did not respond to a request for evacuation and almost certainly would not during the siesta period. Deeply concerned, Johnston radioed a request to the regimental advisor for a U.S. piloted helicopter. He received a regretful refusal because only when Arvin refused a mission could U.S. pilots be sent. Three hours later, an Arvin helicopter landed. The wounded man lost his right eye and was paralyzed on the right side. Johnston, deeply involved, helped load him on the helicopter. With the SDC post almost completed, the battalion moved the bulldozer across the canal to assist in the construction of a watchtower. While being offloaded from an LCM, it became stuck in the soft mud. Johnston and his counterpart hurried to the scene. Having had some experience with tracked vehicles, Johnston felt he had the solution, but kept it to himself to permit Khan to direct operation. The battalion commander's methods were suitable for wheeled vehicles, but only succeeded in bogging down the tractor even more. Both the battalion commander and his U.S. advisor were worried for several reasons. First, they might lose a bulldozer. Second, the troops were under harassing fire. And third, the all-important deadline of Tet was drawing closer. Delay could well cost the men their holiday and battalion morale could become dangerously low. As he later admitted, Johnston's concern for the men led him to use poor judgment. He attempted to advise his counterpart in front of his officers and men, leading Khan to reject the recommended solution. Khan's acceptance of advice given in front of others would have caused him to lose face, so he continued to use his own methods. Even procurement of a second bulldozer and use of all available men didn't help. Finally, Johnston in private issued an ultimatum to Khan. Use the method he had recommended or he would make a report to regiment. This would result in even greater loss of face and possible disciplinary action for Khan. The battalion commander reluctantly gave in. Johnston's method was to anchor the bottom of the track to a stationary object so the tractor would pull itself over its own treads and out of the hole it had dug for itself. His method worked. The men threw their hats in the air in a spontaneous expression of joy. They made it. A 
A few days later, their mission was fully accomplished. The SDC post was completed. The SDC men and their families moved in to man the post and set up housekeeping, bringing in firewood for cooking and drinking water. It was a scene of domestic tranquility against a backdrop of anticipated violence. With the post fully completed in 10 days, the battalion headed back to Duqua. The Viet Cong, unsympathetic as always, hit them with an ambush. It was quickly met with small arms and mortar fire. Khan directed the action. More 1st Battalion casualties were added to the price of the SDC post. Captured VC prisoners showed there was another side to the balance sheet. Now they could complete the final leg of their journey back to Duqua. A few days later, Captain Johnston received orders for reassignment to the United States. He had said goodbye to all the men except the wounded. His good friend, Khan, was with him on this last mission. There was a heartwarming mutual respect between advisor and counterpart, and between officers and men. At least one advisory technique had burned itself fully into Johnston's subconscious. These were indeed his troops. It was time for him to return to the United States and for Lieutenant Clement to replace him. The new battalion advisor had already learned, as Johnston had, that a careless word or action could not only jeopardize the success of a mission, but could cost the United States dearly in goodwill and cooperation. He recognized that the rapport developed by Captain Johnston had been achieved at great personal sacrifice and at considerable cost to the United States. Inevitably, there would be problems. It would be up to him to work them out as Johnston had. However, one fact was certain, all else being equal, he would have an easier time of it because his predecessor had laid the foundation of a workable relationship with his counterpart and the rest of the battalion. As Johnston met officials, such as the district chief and Arvin regimental commander, he was aware of the need to understand the Vietnamese people without becoming involved in their politics. The advisor's duty was to adhere to the U.S. national policy, and his obligation would be to support the military operations of the incumbent government of Vietnam. When Johnston reported to the 1st Battalion, they were stationed at a sugar mill at Hipwa. The main source of sugar, rum, and molasses for all of the Republic of Vietnam, it was located in the Mekong Delta on the Oriental River, 16 kilometers east of the Cambodian border. One primary mission of the 1st Battalion was to provide security for the mill, as well as to stop the Viet Cong from forcibly collecting taxes from farmers who brought in sugar cane. Captain Johnston made it a point not to rush matters in establishing himself with the Vietnamese and with Captain Kong. With them here is Sergeant Doc, a school teacher drafted into the army and now Johnston's interpreter. The American captain learned that the mill employed 2,000 workers and was in an area largely controlled by the Viet Cong. He and Kong estimated that 30% of the employees were guerrillas who operated on night patrols disrupting supply lines. Feeling his way carefully, one of Captain Johnston's first recommendations was to improve artillery emplacements, thereby increasing flexibility of fire for the 155 howitzers at the sugar mill.
He also suggested that living in shelters improvised from ponchos was neither helping morale nor contributing to supply economy, and Khan agreed to construct barracks. Another basic mission of the battalion was to secure a portion of the only usable road for transport of persons. Since the outbreak of hostilities in 1959, United States Army advisors in Vietnam have undergone a variety of experiences and learned much about the complexities of guerrilla warfare in Southeast Asia. Working through MAG, these advisors have increased in number to more than 12,000. Each is assigned to a specific activity or unit of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, commonly referred to as Arvin, where his chief duties are to make certain that U.S. equipment is used and maintained properly, and to teach by lecture, demonstration, and by setting an example. Perhaps the advisor's most important function is to advise and assist the unit commander, his Arvin counterpart, to make suggestions skillfully and diplomatically in a manner adjusted to the customs and traditions of the Vietnamese and to the individual personality of the commander. Since 1959, in fact since 1956, when MAG advisors were first sent to Vietnam, many lessons have been learned, many guidelines, techniques and principles have been developed. Perhaps the best way to describe the experiences of U.S. advisors in their relationship with the Vietnamese, and to illustrate the lessons learned, is to tell the story of one U.S. officer, Captain William R. Johnston, who from May 1962 until April 1963 served as MAG advisor to the 1st Infantry Battalion, 11th Regiment, 7th Infantry Division, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. 34-year-old Michigan-born Captain Johnston, with a wife and two children in Chicago, would soon learn that his military assignment required a thorough knowledge of counter-guerrilla techniques and infantry tactics, as well as of all staff functions. More important, he would discover that to maintain a workable relationship with Captain Tran Tien Khan, his Arvin counterpart, and with other Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, he would have to make some changes in his approach toward human relationships. His counterpart, Captain Khan, had received infantry and artillery training in the United States, but there was still the large gulf of two divergent cultures separating them. To function efficiently as a unit advisor, it would be up to Captain Johnston to bridge this gulf as rapidly and as completely as Vietnamese customs would permit. 